Welcome to whiskey.com where fine spirits meet. My name is Lüning, Horst Lüning. This is my son Ben. And today we're sitting here for our expert tasting in new chairs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got new chairs. Maybe you've already seen the chairs. I had one test run with a with a black chair. It was a bit too high. You can see the, the uh, whiskeys in the background and it was actually really comfortable. But these new chairs are also pretty comfortable. Um, I wanted to have leather chairs, but usually the leather is always really, really dark. So we just have brown and brown. And uh, they were really, really, really expensive, these old Chesterfield chairs. So we kind of got some cheaper ones. <laughs> yeah. But they're pretty they good. are really yeah. comfortable. So yeah. we're already sitting here for one and a half hours and, and it's really pretty nice. Yeah. So maybe maybe you also enjoy the videos more because we're a bit more relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> but also there was a bit of a problem. We can't get closer to each other because of the yeah little thing is the armrests at, at, at the front. So uh, we are also a bit smaller. So yeah, but you still have the close-up cameras to to get really close to us. I think usually we are one of the YouTubers a bit bigger. But now with the YouTubers who actually have legs. Do they really have legs? <laughs> Most of the YouTubers <laughs> don't have legs, they're yeah. all disabled. <laughs> so there are, there are people coming in. This is not leather, this is Chinese plastic. Yes, my chair is Chinese plastic. In the, in the start, first half year, it was stinking like hell. It was incredible. <laughs> Instant Kung Fu virus. <laughs> <laughs> Hello from North Carolina. Armenia. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So uh, what are we having today? In the today, this testing? is a follow-up video to the last one, mm -hmm. or live stream to the last one. We had a beginner's tasting, and today we have the follow-up expert's tasting, and we decided to have the same distilleries as before mm -hmm. and we take the older ones but unfortunately those older ones are expensive mm -hmm. really expensive and those four bottles add up to close to 400 mm -hmm. euros yep. yeah and what is really really interesting is we we really discussed a lot what should we do for the we don't want to call it expert tasting i'm not quite sure how how we named the video here but uh, it's kind of an advanced tasting. So this is this is not like the real the malt heads, but this is like when you get a bit more deeper into the hobby. And what is what I'm really proud of is that we got the Tully Barden 15 because the Tully Barden 15 is quite a recently new whiskey. Mm -hmm. So uh, a really interesting whiskey. It appeared just a few weeks before. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and uh, this time because those whiskeys are a little bit more expensive. Uh, we have smaller ones. We have our own miniatures for that. Mm -hmm. So we're not tasting from the big bottles. So we're saving money. Yeah, for uh, for our German customers, uh, we couldn't just tell everybody, yeah, get the get the four hundred, <laughs> <laughs> get the bottles for four hundred euros. That would have been a bit mean. So we had smaller bottles. Um, we all filled them by ourselves. Um, write a little. Um, label on it and we had a little plastic cap that yeah, you can... Yeah, and you got some uh, lessons how to do it. Yeah, how to be German law. To German regulations. <laughs> yeah, the, their regulations when you fill bottles, you have to... Your, the one who has to bottle it has to have access to clean water and then you have to hand sanitize before you start and they're like, okay, then you have to clean your filling equipment, uh, disinfect your filling equipment to put disinfectant through it because whiskey is a disinfectant. But I think these regulations are for everything. Yeah, for everything, sure, sure. So, um, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. um, but if you get into more into the hobby, let's say you've just watched the beginner's live tasting and you got a bit into the whiskey and you, you really felt the whiskey and, and you want to be more into that hobby, there is more to whiskey than we just told you that yesterday. That was just like the the tip of the iceberg, the, the start of everything. If you get really get into the, the hobby of uh, whiskey, then you usually also visit Scotland because that's where the most of the whiskey, the single malt, the premium stuff comes from. Uh, let's have a look at um, Scotland. This is a map of Scotland. And at the, at the pretty much bottom, where there's a bit of a narrowing in, there's Glasgow and there is Edinburgh. And Glasgow and Edinburgh, are pretty big cities 
and usually you can get flights from uh, the major cities from, from major directly. cities to to Glasgow. So let's say from from where we come from from Germany from Munich there's a direct flight to Edinburgh and uh, Edinburgh is the big base of EasyJet. Yeah, EasyJet and um, so usually you start start off either in Glasgow or in Edinburgh. You can either go through Glasgow and then drive around through Agulhem Brut, which is just west of that, uh, and then you have the peninsula of Campbelltown and start off from there with ferries to Isla or Isle of Mull or Isle of Skye and just ferry around the islands on the um, west coast. Or you go through the Grand Pain Mountains and visit the famous Speyside. And if you visit, let's say, a distillery like Glen Farkless, uh, you can see it here. Um, then you always have to check beforehand um, if this distillery is open to visitors because some distilleries are not open. Glen Farkless is open to visitors and the normal, the usual, the casual tour for the beginners um, is um, you don't really have to book for it. You don't get that much, you get a small tasting in the end. Um, but at these distilleries, you can also get much more of a tasting. You can get the the ages, uh, I think, de or the decades, the decades tasting at Glen Farkless, where you pay 400 and you get, like, I think, mm -hmm. uh, 40, 50, 60, and yeah, something like that, or 350 or something like that. Um, then another distillery that I'm going to show you here, um, that is Lafroig. And when you go to Scotland, it's not like a like a tour where you can't see anything. It's you you take it as a vacation with a vacation combined with your hobby. So you have a nice uh, cruise around uh, the Scottish Sea, and you st uh, stop at Isla, and you can visit Bunna Heaven or here Lafroig and watch the sea and just enjoy the countryside of Scotland with a lot of sheep. And that's how you, you enjoy and your whiskey. stay with whiskey. <laughs> but then um, I've already told you that they're not all distilleries are open to visitors. Here is an example that is not open. That's the Tamdu distillery. You can have a glimpse from the old um, railway station. Uh, station there into the Tamdu distillery, but you can't visit it. The only way you get in is to get really acquitted with the... Um, people from the distillery or you will watch one of my videos because I've been uh, I've been led in to Tamdu because we have really good connections with them and we have, I've done a little documentary about it so um, that's really nice to watch to get the feel of these distilleries but um, if you want to go to Scotland um, you should go during the summertime because the winter time is pretty rainy and up in the, in the mountains, it's also pretty snowy. So the best time to visit Scotland is in the summer that starts from, let's say, June to September. But during that time, there are a lot of tourists there. Tourism yeah. is really And there are beautiful big. days in October as well as in mm -hmm. March. So, and but there don't are... go there because you will disturb my video filming. <laughs> 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 no, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it a bit off season to get uh, get the not that, that many people in front of my lens. Yeah. Um, what is also really nice when you visit Scotland are the whiskey festivals in April and in May. Um, there are many whiskey festivals. The Highland Whiskey Festival. There's the Space Side Festival. The the Face Ale. That's the uh, whiskey festival on Isla. They are really nice, but uh, they are really, crowded. really crowded, crowded now. And you have to book your hotel or bed and breakfast in advance. Yes, it's a bit more expensive, and um, you can you can see it like a whiskey fair. There are a lot of people there, but there's also a lot of cultural things going on. There's uh, bagpipes. There is uh, usually some stone throwing and some kilt guys going around. So there's really you, you really get the feel of the culture uh, within the Scottish land countryside about that. Yeah, good. So uh, I think I've talked enough, and let's let's have the first whiskey. Yeah, you're dry in your mouth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I need some so whiskey. I decided uh, in which sequence we will have these whiskeys, and uh, well, 
It depends. We now have aged whiskies with 18, three times 18 years and one time 15 years. And how to put them in sequence? Well, it's quite easy. You put the Lidgeck in the back because it's that peaty and that strong, that smoky. And the Isla Whiskey Bunnehaven, uh, I put it also uh, second to last uh, because it's Isla, it's intense, and I know that whiskey very well. And uh, then there are two left, the Okintoshin, 18 years old, and the Tuli Bardin, 15 years old. And I decided to put the Okintoshin, 18 year old, in as first because it's triple distilled. And triple distilled means it's a weaker alcohol, it's smoother, uh, and the 18 year old might be more mature, but sometimes the more maturation brings more cask influence. But it's sad uh, that the Ogentoshan 18 year old is only bourbon cask matured. So we put that at first. Mm -hmm. so, so we did it just like the beginners. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so uh, we uh, emptied, that, there are four centiliters in it and we put out one centiliter each. Mm -hmm. So there's half of it still in there. Uh, but we didn't finish the whiskey. So we keep a little bit in the glass uh, to have a comparison later on between those four. Mm -hmm. So here we are. So last time we did have, did we have the three wood or did we have the, 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 uh, the 12? This is the card box. It's quite simple. And I think this is the old one. There's a new one coming up very mm -hmm. shortly. Uh, so this might be something for collectors. Yeah, the thing is, uh, the, the new cardboard is out. Um, not quite sure which country is already out, but uh, not in Germany yet. But they mm -hmm. launched it uh, end of 2019. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've already seen there's one guy who, who wrote uh, a question into the chat. Uh, we're going to answer questions, but the question section will be in the end of the video. What we like to see is then tasting notes. Uh, yeah. Um, let's have a few words to Ockentoschen as well. Ockentoschen is one of the older distilleries. It's from the 18th century. And it was said it was produced already in 1800, but the name was Dantoche then, not Ockentoschen. And... Uh, it was licensed in 1823 uh, when the big license act came through, uh, but it was already allowed to produce whiskey before because it was in, it's located in the lowlands and not in the highlands and the ban on producing malt whiskey was in the highlands. So mm -hmm. this was Ockentoschen and uh, the 18 year old is one of the standards from the distillery. Mm -hmm. It's 40%, no, 43% ABV. It's one of the well-known old brands where you had 40% for the young whiskies and 43% for the better ones, for the more expensive ones. And uh, well, higher ABVs weren't normal to that distillery. So we typically have 43 as the best or the highest uh, uh, strength of that whiskey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's triple distilled from the lowlands, so it's weaker. And it's in the mid-60s in the price. So it's still affordable for an 18-year-old. In former times, mm -hmm. the 18-year-old had been a lot cheaper. But then with the shortage of matured whiskey, the prices went up. And Ockentoschen is one of the distilleries which isn't going that up. They have enough there, very wise in production. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cheers. That's what we're nosy. <laughs> Nosing first. <laughs> yeah, we're sitting here for one and a half hours, and <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sorry <laughs> for for <laughs> hurrying down that. So it's a little bit of caramel, and then I have this well, those fermented herbs like like tea or tobacco, not burnt tobacco, but fresh tobacco. And a little bit of nuttiness or almonds. That's what I have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you really got me with the, the fermented tea here. What, what you really find out when you, when you compare it to the ones that we had with the beginners, the 12-year-old, 
this is much more mature and much more deep. There is a, a lot more oomph to it, a lot stronger. You have a bit of a tobacco note in there, a lot of fermented tea. That really reminds me of that, uh, of that not plantation, that, that tea factory on Ceylon. Not Ceylon, Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka, uh, colonist. Yeah. You. <laughs> <laughs> I think they called themselves no. Ceylon, Ceylon Tea <laughs> Factory no, or something. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> or I said it all the time. Yes. <laughs> but you came, uh, you came back, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> mm, a little yeah. really. And a little uh, starting to be spicy. This little almond, probably. So it might come from the. From the Does any, any of you have that whiskey in the glass? If you do have it in the glass, write something how you, you uh, taste it. Mm. Really need to start exporting. <laughs> I really need these guys to, to have it in the glass because it's just so much more fun if everybody has it yeah. in the glass. Cheers. Cheers. There's more. It's stronger. So when we had it first, it wasn't that strong. Did you mix up the... No. <laughs> That's the right one. Mm. That's it. That's extreme. Mm -hmm. A lot more than before. Mm -hmm. So I have the caramel, a little sugary, some sweetness, but oakiness, tobacco, long aftertaste, oak. But... In the end, no bitterness, no long-lasting sharpness. So, in total, it's quite smooth in the finish, in the aftertaste. So there was this uh, extreme intense taste when I had it on my tongue, much more than the 43% suggested. Mm -hmm. mm. What I find is uh, it's very interesting because, as you said, it's a very, very intense whiskey. Intensity with a lot of cask, a lot of oak, mm, also that tobacco, a bit of a spiciness, nutmeg, this fermented tea. There's a lot in it compared with that, with that smoothness from the triple distillation. So it's it's far away from the twelve year old or the the um, yeah the milder editions, and it's really interesting because it's a. A mild whiskey that is really mature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm, I'm not quite sure if I ever had the 18 before today. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> <laughs> you missed it last time, no? Mm, we had it's it's it one of your distilleries. I've never been to Old Toshin before. Uh -huh. Even though I've driven past it like 20 times. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, there's Old Toshin. I've been. Never been there. <laughs> I've been three times, yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. nice whiskey. Mm -hmm. you, you put it up to the top, mm. or to the top, okay. Mm. To keep the sequence <laughs> not not quite clean. <laughs> um, so we're going on. We're going further, <laughs> and those old whiskies are not that available as they were some decades ago. So the older whiskies were bought with the globalization of malt whiskey. So the people bought them everywhere. Prices went up quite steeply. And uh, there had been whiskies which became expensive, incredible, like the Port Ellen. And here you see a picture of the Port Ellen 10th an uh, anniversary edition. Uh, no, uh, annual releases, they were called, I think. They are gone now. And uh, those bottles, in the beginning, they started with a 1,000 euros and then went up until three and a half thousand or four thousand a bottle so they were incredibly expensive because they were the last of the distillery and the warehouses ran empty and uh, when they finished it they thought about this was a wonderful business why do we stop and then they decided they uh, will build the Port Ellen distillery again so with the old plans, uh, with the 
old equipment so that Port Allen will rise again from the ashes. Mm -hmm. So this is wonderful. And uh, the new ones will, of course, have no age statement on it. Oh, and I don't know. Oh, will they write three years on it? Or well, maybe they have not released one for 10 years. <laughs> no, I don't think so, because uh, there are controllers in charge of the business. <laughs> yeah, I think they'll, they'll <laughs> release a NAS. <laughs> a NAS. The first NAS will be over 100. Mm -hmm. Yeah, talking uh, about NAS. Huh? Uh, there are, we do have a NAS whiskey, no age statement whiskey, and this is a bottle uh, which is very interesting, which is as well from Ockentoshen, but not only ex bourbon casks as the 18 year old is, but uh, three or three different casks, a sherry cask in it, I think a portwood cask as well, and an European sherry cask. Uh, so it's really heavily uh, added from the casks, from the fortified wines which laid in those casks and the intensity is stronger than the 18 year old but it's more a you know, aggressive taste in the front not this smooth old mature taste in the back and if you if you're uh, an advanced whiskey uh, enthusiast i would say and if you come to circles of uh, whiskey tasters there's always that discussion are the new new nas whiskies that come out pretty often now but I think they tend to go back a bit but during the last decade there was a lot of NAS whiskey coming out. Are you pro or against it? Um, I think I'm pro because if the people buy all the NAS whiskies then there will be more H whiskies for us. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a good side and a bad side to it. Um, if they neglect maturing whiskey for longer years the officials of the distillery, then I think it's a bad thing. Mm. So, but if they use the NAS whiskey uh, to, well, conserve their stocks for, for older whiskies, then I think it's a very good thing. And there's not only Port Allen to be reopened again, there's as well uh, Brora, which is will come up next. And Brora, as well mm. as Port Allen, they too belong to the same company and they invested I think 5.3 million pounds for uh, the, well, the rebuild of the distillery. And I had been at Brora here from the a view from the uh, Kleinlich distillery down to Brora. They are sister companies and I was able to look through a wooden fence or a wooden gate. There was a, uh, a gap in and could see the old distiller stills in there, in there. So I don't know if they will restart with the old stills or if they have to build new ones uh, to the plans of the old one. And it must be in this year, last next year, when they start production. So three years from now or from next year, uh, there will be new malt whiskey coming. So uh, when have you been there? I think it was... 2004 or 2005. Yeah, yeah, that, that camera. The was second pretty, time. Pretty first good. Time, first time was 95. 95, okay, mm -hmm. so, but it was already the, the closed. Uh, Brora was closed, Kleinlich was running, uh, and Kleinlich is a distillery uh, with the big new building as it was uh, typical in the late 60s and early 70s with those big windows where you could see the pot stills through and have a wonderful view from the inside to the outside with those big windows like Kalila, like uh, Tininik, like Glenord. They all are from the same time uh, mm -hmm. where those uh, construction type was uh, typical. But Brora here is an old one with those uh, old uh, natural stone brick buildings and this chimney, this brick stim chimney. Yeah. So nice to see there's the whiskey pipeline on the right hand side of the picture coming from Klein Leach to the bottling facility down there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so. Talking about reopening, huh? Yeah, so Tulip Barden was a distillery which closed a few months before I was there. So I stood in front of closed gates. And then it was in 1994, and then in 2003, uh, they started again with the production. And then Baxter's uh, built a new 
shopping facility there close to the highway. You can see the, the lorry in the back on the highway. And they hoped that people would come and, and buy uh, wooden shirts. Uh, and they had quite a big uh, sale there. Uh, but uh, it didn't work out, so they stopped there. And Tulibardin was able to take over that equipment for cheap, or those buildings for cheap. Now they have a bottling facility, and they have the fermenters, or the wash bags. In you can see them uh, through the windows there. And uh, yeah, Tulibardin is again into production since 2003. And if you add 15 years, then you end up in 2018. And now in 2020, the new 15-year-old is there. So they did not start with the first year of production, but the second year of production to bring out the 15-year-old with the new one. There are old bottles of Tulibardin out on the market, a 20-year-old, a 25-year-old from the Fine Age collection. Uh, but I think they are really expensive. The 25-year-old is high in three digits, so 500, 600, I think. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, and now we have the 15-year-old Tulibardin as the next bottle. And this is the first uh, of the new aged whiskies. They didn't bring out the 10-year-old, so they omitted that. They stay, uh, stayed with the no-aged whiskies, but with the good cast, the 228, uh, the 250 and how they all are called. Uh, wonderful whiskies, but now they have an aged whiskey, 15 years. It's 43% ABV, uncolored, uh, non-chill filtered with 43, and it's in the mid 50s in the price. So it's affordable. Mm -hmm. It's nice to, uh, this is kind of like a, a premiere because uh, uh, it just came out recently and we just, just barely made it shipping to the the customers and everybody just got their their bottles in time and uh, yeah so this is kind of a, a premiere uh, we haven't tasted it beforehand we just have tasted it in the in the german take so we do know what we're expecting and yeah tulibardin 15 is quite quite an interesting thing oh Don't yeah forget this wonderful uh box gift box and they have this uh, fancy uh, opening. Uh, you can see it, how it opens to each other. Uh, and there are some magnets in it. Uh, you're tired, aren't oh, you? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Comfortable chairs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I had some, well, some tiredness a few minutes ago, <laughs> and there are those uh, mirror neurons in our yeah. brains uh, where you copy the behavior of your neighbor. So this is as well with the taste of whiskey. If your neighbor says this smells like that and that, then you copy that. Mm -hmm. And if you're yawning, it's the same. <laughs> Not quite sure if we should get the footrests matching to the chair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what did they write? Manuja, hey buddy. I, I write marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> Too much on miniatures. Ban is tired, yes. So I'm just back from vacations and I'm not quite used to the new time slot, uh, time zone. Yeah. Okay. So what do you have in your glass? Or should I start? Free magnetic boxes. Sometimes more than the whiskey inside. Oops. So this is fruity in mm. comparison. It's really fruity. And there's some baked apple in it with cloves in it. This would be would have been nice for Christmas. Yeah. And a little bit of vanilla and dry hay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For me, it's it's yeah, definitely very fruity, and also you do have a lot of. It's also flowery, so you do have a lot of uh, 
a lot of yeah grass flowery there's a a bloomy grassy hill with a lot of a lot of sweetness in it as well as you said i think you said baked apple or cooked mm -hmm. apple or something like that baked definitely apple. definitely in there so it's a, a nice relaxing interesting whiskey it's a mixture between uh sherry casks and bourbon casks yeah it's it's finished isn't it uh, i think it's a mixture it doesn't say if it's finished or not but uh it doesn't even say anything about the the bottles on the on the bottle, maybe on the box. I don't know. We're Germans. <laughs> Put the labels right. <laughs> <laughs> if that's all. Yeah. So cheers. Cheers. Mm. And one take on the Burgundy from Tully Bardian. Do or don't, and definitely a do. The Burgundy 228, it's a wonderful whiskey. Mm -hmm. It's incredible good. Yeah, mm -hmm. so this is wonderful, juicy, but intense. Some spiciness in it, little sweetness, some nuttiness probably from part of sherry cast. This is uncolored, so it has to be a little bit of sherry cask influence in it, at least. So definitely there, some strawberry jam, probably a little sweetness. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. mm. It's nice. Well, last time, I think, did we have the burgundy? I think we had the burgundy. We had it, it once, yes. Yes. and. Um, this one is like a nice sherry whiskey, but it's also very mature. Mm -hmm. So you do have a, a mixture between these apples and fruits and, and yeah, sherry tones, like a real sherry and combined with an oakiness. So, so I'm, it's I'm astonished spices. how good the first mm -hmm. matured whiskey under the new leadership mm -hmm. with the Maybe maybe they, they wanted to bring out the 15-year-old at the beginning, but they just had to find the right mixture <laughs> during the last Or they would like years. to preserve the, mm -hmm. the relatively small amount they produced in the start. Because if they would have started with a 10-year-old, they would have mm -hmm. brought out masses, which they now sold with Nass whiskies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Long, mm -hmm. creamy, a little spicy, not bitter. So the aftertaste is very comfortable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, pretty nice whiskey. So what, what I love about this is this is not like a, like a one day fly. Mm. It's a sorry. There's a question, Alessandro Igano. What are your favorite peated whiskies? Not from Isla. Um, Did you? <laughs> <laughs> we put one in here. <laughs> so uh, wait a little. And mm -hmm. ah, Moscow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what I love about this one is this is not a one-time thing. This is um, mm -hmm. a bottle that will be in the standard uh, range from Tullibardin. So we're gonna enjoy this for for years and years to co to come. And yeah, talking about uh, whiskey um, as an as an advanced whiskey connoisseur there are also people who actually don't just buy whiskey for drinking but for collecting yeah there are people who collect whiskey for several different purposes i know of three of them the first is they want to collect because they want to have it mm -hmm. sometimes they are even even uh, sober people anti-alcoholics they collect it because they want to have it so this is our the collectors then there are those value collectors which mm -hmm. uh look for or speculate on rising prices and if the price do not rise well then you have a wonderful whiskey to taste and the third one is a, a connoisseur who buys now because he thinks in the future whiskies won't be that good as this one is today 
So they are the, the, uh, the consumer collectors, the value collectors, and the collector ide- collectors. <laughs> collector collectors, <laughs> idealistic collectors. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what kind of whiskies can you collect? A bottle of each distillery, mm-hmm. probably, or everybody a bottle of a particular distillery. This mm-hmm. might turn out a little bit too expensive. <laughs> so there have been people collecting every bottle of Macallan, but then the Macallan prices rocketed like hell, and you had to pay 100000 for a bottle, and there were only very few Japanese and Asian guys <laughs> willing to pay that. So then collections broke and they were no longer uh, uh, complete. And then uh, thoughts changed about, well, I do not have a complete collection. From mm-hmm. Art Beck, uh, there had been very few bottles out there so that you weren't able to get one. So people turned away from Art Beck, from collecting Art Beck, because they weren't able to get one. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, there is... A distillery which is very worth collecting, and this is the Beaumont uh, bottle from the last century, I think. It was in the late 1990s. The Sea Dragon bottle in a ceramic decanter, and that sold for less than a hundred, I think. And today, you won't get it below four figures, so it's really really expensive today so the investment turned collectors out, yes, <laughs> turned out great turned out great <laughs> and uh, there had been a, a moonshine or moonlight bottling 22 years old later on 25 year old and from those the new 25 year olds uh, uh, arose but no longer with his uh, very particular uh, bottlings and this showed that Beaumont uh, was bought by Japanese a Japanese company, mm-hmm. so uh, they brought those Japanese pictures on that bottles. So definitely collectors' items, and uh, there are typically questions: How long does those bottles uh, last? These ceramics had s- problems because they weren't uh, that completely uh, close uh, by the cladding outside. So there had been very small holes, I think, in it, and they lost volume. And uh, if you have a collector's model and then uh, you lose volume, then it goes down to the neck and then to a quarter neck, half neck, three quarters neck, full neck, and then prices go down. But if the the level goes down to full neck, uh, then... uh, it is typically such a rare and expensive bottle, it doesn't matter any longer. So as as long as anything is in that bottle, uh, it will get its price. And to Mm. avoid evaporation on the bottles, you can use a a foil called parafoam. You have a box there. Mm -hmm. Um, This is a... Oh yeah, let's show it first. This is the box called Parafilm. You get it uh, in the uh, supplies for the labor- laboratories. Laboratories. The chemists. And it's kind of US made because it's got the <laughs> the, f- the funny units on it. <laughs> <laughs> so there's 125 feet on it. It's not that cheap. Uh, it's, I think, four inches uh, wide. And uh, you turn off the... Uh, the paper dividing those uh, is foil and then you have this and this is uh, plastic this is not elastic it's a adds a plasticity and you go over here and then you turn it you twist it around here and with the uh, twist uh, you get some tension on it and you can fix it that nothing will evaporate on it from it uh, but you typically have to go down uh, just go below the capsule okay. um, to get it tight, really tight. And the good thing is this one is so pure and uh, that you can close these analytic uh, uh, substances in, in chemistry without uh, diluting or uh, 
putting straight things in it. So it, it's very, very clean foil and it does not uh, stick to not all, most of the capsules that you don't tear off the, uh, the color if you uh, remove it and you use it uh, not only for preserving bottles you're collecting for a long time, but as well for bottles you're already opened and had a little bit out of it and then you fix it for keeping it for for several years. Yeah, if you if you drink a really expensive or if you try a really expensive bottle and you open it and you enjoy it with friends but you don't finish it, this parafilm is one of the good investments then. Yeah. So and if you have a circle of, of whiskey friends, I think one roll of tape <laughs> is far enough. It's 125 feet is like 40 meters. That's like really a lot. <laughs> really a lot. And uh, um, and it's not that expensive. Such a roll costs around 30 or 40. Uh, yeah. And how long does a whiskey last if you fix it that way? Well, I'm just coming back from Antarctica and there they found a bottle over 100 years old below an expedition hut of Ernest Shackleton and uh, those whiskies were still good. Richard Patterson, uh, he, uh, they collected two of those bottles from this uh, heritage and they were allowed to take small samples uh, from those bottles and they did a gas chromatography on that and there will be a video on our channel very soon where I describe that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, so whiskey is able to get very, very old. Mm -hmm. So, but there's one thing that you really have to look out for when you're collecting bottles because maybe you miss one bottle when it's coming out. You can't buy it at your trusty local shop. And then you have to look out for false bottles. Have a look at this bottle here. It's a McAllen, 1949. Is it a real one? <laughs> nope, no back label. And there's a little sticker down there and it says, not for human consumption. This here is not uh, uh, a false bottle or a fake. This is just a show bottle. And a show bottle means that, that we got this for display in our, in our local shop when we still had the local shop. Mm -hmm. um, but when you look out for, for fake bottles, um, yeah, usually try to buy at your trusted shop who, who you know and who gets the, uh, gets the bottles through the official lines. But if you, uh, if you go on eBay or sometimes Amazon as well, uh, there are fakers out there. Mm -hmm. You had some numbers about that, how many uh, fakers there are? There are a big number. So it's very likely that you get a fake one. If you say, oh, well, this is a little bit cheap, I will take that. Don't do it. Mm -hmm. So uh, good is if you buy a bottle as a collector, uh, keep the invoice. Mm -hmm. and you have a proof and uh, do not have an invoice from somebody, but from a uh, renowned good shop where you can say, here, I bought it, this is the proof. Mm -hmm. And typically you have more uh, bottles on that invoice, so make copies uh, to give it away with the bottle if you sell it. Yeah, and if this bottle would have been real, then we would, have, would be sweating here, not to <laughs> dropping it, because it was six-digit figures. Mm -hmm. So... But really it's just a show bottle. Yeah. <laughs> and Probably, we're not going to try to sell it as a real one. <laughs> Probably if, if you're going to resign <laughs> and then heading for Paraguay or something. <laughs> Take one of these bottles with yeah. you. <laughs> so yeah, watch out for, for the fake ones. And the thing is, uh, I've seen a video that um, these fake bottles are really going down low in price when you say, ah, this is just a hundred dollar worth of bottle, a hundred dollar bottle. Uh, they do fake these as well. And I've also seen some of them faking JD bottles. So Jack Daniels uh, is, how much is that? Usually $15, 15 euros, 18 euros, yeah. something like that. And they're faking these as well. So yeah, the fakers are all over the place and they're not just with the 2000 and up bottles, but with all of the bottles now. Mm. Yeah. So I think we're good for the next one. Next one. So now we're going to Isla, huh? Yep. 
Buna Haven, 18 years of age. This bottle is quite rare now. Uh, so this shows uh, that the amount of whiskies in that distillery or in the warehouses of that distillery isn't, is no longer that big. So the prices rise a lot. So this is, uh, might be close to 200 and it will most often not available at all. There is a 25 year old on the market as well in a wooden box, but that's a few hundred more. Um, mm. So this distillery is really overboard. So that the, the amounts of, of whiskey is no longer there. Someone said, check your miniature. It's the right miniature. It's the right miniature. <laughs> and I can even smell them. That's the yeah. right miniature. Just had it for, uh, half so an hour it's ago. It's 46.3 ABV. And it's unchill filtered, uncolored as well. And uh, yeah, it's sherry an cask matured. It's a sherry cask mature engine, yeah. So it's sweet, it's sherry, it's dried fruits, a little spiciness, a little nuttiness, as typical with sherry casts, and a little maritime note. Yeah, that's Isla. Little C. And sweet. Incredible sweet. So we're tasting here for for <laughs> nearly two hours now. Uh, or more than two hours. So uh, we're getting deeper and deeper into the whiskey. Mm -hmm. Not from the amount. So you, you see we, we <laughs> leave most of it in the glass. Uh, uh, but you add up those aromas in your in your mouth hmm it's a yeah it's a lovely uh, whiskey with a lot of um, I would say oak aroma in it so it's it's really deeper it's really stronger and uh, there's also a bit of caramel note in it I like it so it's mm -hmm. uh, but the the amount of smoke is very limited very, very, yeah, limited. very limited. So last time the Buna Heaven, we said, oh, lightly smoked. This time it's, yeah, what's what's lighter than lightly smoked? Very light smoke. <laughs> <laughs> a hint of smoke. A whiff. A, a, whiff, whiff, of a whiff of smoke. Yeah, a little, little smoke. Yeah. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. Mm -hmm. This is... First, the 43 ABV, it's stronger than the others we had before, mm -hmm. definitely. And uh, it shows this sherry aroma, this full impact maritime note on it, yeah. So this is, yeah, wonderful whiskey, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I like that. Mm. Mm. I love it. it. You really. Whew, now it quite hits me with with the oak. Mm. So it's a a mixture between a, a sherry whiskey, but what comes really through in the second taste is uh, is it's much more deeper. The first one is it's much. I do now get the the um, the dark chocolate, the bittersweet chocolate. In the first try, I didn't get the dark bittersweet chocolate. Get more of the the C notes. I get more of the light pepperiness. So it's a lot, a lot darker, less sherry than in, in the first one. Mm, I like it. Mm -hmm. And it shows uh, the the intensity of the Bunnahaven 12 year old we had in the beginners tasting. There is this relationship to the young whiskey of the same distillery. Yeah, very mm. good. What's next? Mm. We'd like to tell tell something about the color of whiskey. Yeah, uh, last time I've said something about the um, maturation of the whiskey and how it gets this flavor. Also mentioned a little bit of the coloring, and here you can see uh, in detail um, the 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 journey how a whiskey gets a darker 
and you see from the left side light to very dark and now I want to go into detail how that is done you have the cellulosis and the wood sugars within the wood and by heating the wood you break off the cellulosis and you caramelize the sugars and that gives you a caramel color and that gives you the color in the whiskey so when you fill a cask with whiskey first time usually done in uh, over in america with a bourbon cask with all the virgin oaks bourbon always does virgin oaks and you take out more of the flavors and then you ship it over to uh, scotland they call it a first fill bourbon because after the bourbon it's first filled and then you um you get something out as well and that means it's it's not coloring as strongly so the scottish need to store longer so they're older they have age statements and then you have second fill third fill and it gets gets uh, looser every time second uh so the the fourth fill or the refill bourbon barrels they don't give as much color as the the first fill then we have other casks like wine casks or sherry casks. There might still be a bit of wine or sherry inside the pores of the wood. So you do get a bit of color from that as well. And that can mm -hmm. even end up with a bit of a little bit of a, a red color. So what, what happens when you have these casks that have been used over the years and years and years, then they kind of are depleted. And you told me back in the days they just used to toss them, just dispose them. But nowadays, they look a bit more into the, the money side and there <laughs> might be some guys from the controlling department and they calculate, hey, can't we not just reuse them? That's just a lot of money we're throwing away. And that when, when they do rejuvenate them, it's a big industry now, they're rejuvenating. And I'm going to show you one, one from Mia Gikyo, a picture that shows the rejuvenation of a cask. How you rejuvenate a cask is you take um, the cask, you take out the lids, and then you scrape out all the uh, charcoal. So the charcoal has been used up. It reacted with the whiskey and took out the um, um, the unwanted flavors. So the coal, the the charcoal is not really reactive anymore. So you just scrub it out. So that's the shaving. Then you do the toasting. So you reheat the cask. Uh, break off more cellulose, caramelize the wood sugars, give the the the, uh, the cask back its flavor capacity, and in the end, he as you see here, you burn the cask from the inside, and it burns and it produces another charcoal layer, so it can take out uh, unwanted flavors again, and these casks are sometimes called rejuvenated cask. Some people now call them STR cask shaved toasted and recharred um, usually the str is for wine casks and that is then a mixture between a, a virgin oak and a, a wine cask so yeah so that's how you have your maturation with the cask so the cask is really one of the the interesting things and most of the the guys from the distilleries write on their the label what kind of casks they're using um, so that's the natural way of getting your f uh, flavoring and your coloring into the whiskey. But there is a, a not natural way because s some people in Scotland color their whiskey. And there's a famous bottle, I can show you that here. <laughs> it's called Loch Dew Black Whiskey. And I think you can tell us a bit yeah, more about it. This bottle is from Manokmore. And it's 10 years old and it was really cheap. It was in the 20s, below 30. And uh, well, today, if you're looking for that, for a collector's item, you pay 500, 700. And last one, I think, was 700 what? they paid for that. <laughs> and uh, so it's just caramel color in that uh, and twice as much as in Coke. So it's really, really dark and, uh, well, people liked it, but they stopped production uh, after the fun was over. Uh, so there had been a, a mimicry bottle, second one, called Loch 
something. So uh, <laughs> there was somebody else uh, going with that gag. Um, but also that bottle uh, is away from the market. They no longer produce it because people now know what the dark color makes. Mm -hmm. so. But this is like a, a really special one. Usually the um, producers use the caramel color to just even out uh, the uh, coloring between their batches. So all the uh, whiskies within the shelves of, let's say, the liquor stores or in Europe, the supermarkets, they have the same color and nobody's going comparing two bottles and going, oh my God, there's something wrong with my whiskey. It's not the same color as it used to be. So that's the reason why they really do use coloring. Some people make it darker to sell better. Um, and be careful, in Canada, you're allowed to add 9.09% .09 of flavoring and color to your whiskey. In Scotland, I think you're only allowed to add uh, coloring to your whiskey, but a in Germany... Cal caramel, it's called. Yeah, but oh. you have to declare it in most of the countries today. In that most, is. no, in two. In two, okay. Denmark and Germany. Okay. But there is a European regulation uh, which people I have to follow, but they do not follow it. So uh, there is a regulation, uh, a general regulation from the EU, but uh, countries do not write it down. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So, yeah. Next, next is uh, chill filtration. Mm -hmm. So here you can see two bottles. Uh, one on the right hand side, uh, clear, on the left hand side it's cool. It's cool, well there is some, uh, some moisture on the outside because it's that cool. Uh, but you can see as well that it's a little cloudy, hazy inside. That's because a cooler liquid does not have the uh, solution ability as a warmer liquid has. And some uh, substances inside uh, the bottle will cling together. The molecules build bigger structures uh, called mycels, and they you are able to see. And some are so stable that they keep being hazy after getting warm again. Uh, but most of them, they will uh, reduce the cloudiness and go away. And in former times, people poured that liquid uh, over ice, and then the whiskey turned hazy and they said oh that's a bad one so people said well we're cooling it down uh, then press it through a filter and with that filtering uh, we reduce uh, we take out those substances and when it's getting cold again it will no longer turn cloudy because we took out those substances first time when it became cold so this is chill, for, called chill filtration and we did a uh, an experiment, uh, we took, I think, a dozen or 20 uh, unchill filtered whiskies, and half of them, we chill filtered them by ourselves in a glass with a glass filter in a refrigerator. And then we filled samples with numbers on it and uh, sent it out to a hundred connoisseurs with good knowledge about whiskey and asked them to return them uh, and giving hints uh, about the, uh, the quality of the whiskey. And we found out that in average, uh, the chill filtrated whiskies and the non chill filtrated whiskies were the same in, in, uh, in quality. Only the very light ones with very few maturation in casks, the lighter ones, they turned out that the chill filtrated whiskies were better than the unchill filtered, were rated better. But the, with a bigger cask influence, they were just equal. And that might have been the reason why in former times they invented chill filtration, because the not that good whiskeys tasted better. And this mm -hmm. was important in former times, because in the good old times <laughs> when everything was worse. So they had to make the whiskey better by chill filtration. Yeah. Took a break. Which one is the chill filtered one? The filtered looking one. <laughs> Tinks. <laughs> it was the clear one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So now we're coming to the last one. The a bottle called, it's written down, Le Dake. It's pronounced something like Lichik. So with a click, 
uh, sound in it. Mm-hmm. And this is a peated whiskey from the Isle of Mull. And there the Tully Bardin, the only distillery is the Tully Bardin distillery. And the peated whiskey from the Tully Bardin distillery is called Legic. And it's 46.3 ABV. Yeah, we know that. When I have one, it has 46. Point three as well. They are owned by the same mother company. And uh, this one is finished in Spanish sherry cast. You see it's very, very dark and it's uncolored and until filtered as well. And it's a distillery from the 18th century. It's written down 1798. And that's because uh, production of single malt whiskey or malt whiskey was only forbidden in the highlands where the excise offices weren't able to go to, to collect taxes, so they forbid it up there. But on the islands in the United Kingdom, where the islands belongs to, the production was allowed. So this is uh, legalized in 1798. Um, So this is a real and old one. And uh, yeah, Uh, this is the only peated one. And it's the older, brother or relative uh, from the Lichik we had before in the beginner's tasting. Yeah, Tobomoy is a bit of a weak spot because it's the only distillery that we haven't been yet. The only one or one of the one few of the ones? One of the few ones. Yeah, the, one of the classical, the, I think the classical so one that the, we've not been to. Yeah, the last two years it was closed for mm-hmm. renovation. And I wasn't on Mull. I, I just uh, 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 passed Mull with a ferry, uh, but I wasn't on Mull. Yeah. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Quite intense, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's smoky. A, it's wow. a hefty ending. <laughs> yeah. Smoky with a light maritime note. Very intense. Lightly cooling in the nose but it's because it's 46.3 ABV. Yeah, and a lot of smoke. A lot of smoke. Stinky smoke. And it's incredible. A lot of smoke for that an old one. Mm-hmm. Typically the, the peated uh, aromas, the smoky aromas, they reduce, they oxidize over the years in the cask because the cask has a uh, connection to the outside air. It breathes. Uh, when it's becoming warm, it presses the air out. When it's becoming cold, it tears in uh, fresh air. With that, oxidization takes place and the very aggressive fennels, which bring this smoky aromas, uh, are oxidized, turning to more complex aromas, not that sharp, not that intense. Yeah, last time when we had the, the younger Ligic, I'm um, not quite sure if that was as smoky as this one. Or maybe it's just really comparable smoky. But this one is just, uh, it's just massive. It has a lot of oak. It has a lot of spiciness, a lot of smoke in it. So all the heavy smoky and all the heavy uh, aromas are really packed into this whiskey. I love it. Mm. Mm. Sweet, incredible sweet, intense, spicy oakiness, and going over to licorice in the aftertaste, lightly bitterness from the licorice, juicy, sweet, long aftertaste, and a little bit of maritime notes. Yeah, it's better than the first (laughs) round. The first round it was so stinky, so Mm -hmm. incredible. Mm -hmm. Now it's a lot better. It's still, it's a hefty one. It's a strong one, it's a hefty one. There's a lot of smoke in it, but you do have a lot of oak and a lot of um, licorice in it that, that, or it feels like licorice because there's a sweetness in it as well. 
And if you if you really concentrate on it, if you get used to the, the taste, you do feel that there is a bit of a, a sherry touch to it. It's a slight sherry touch because all the other flavors are just so intense, but there is a sherry touch to it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like it. Mm -hmm. So better than the first one. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to to, be, to get used to to whiskey. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Okay. So there's one guy already uh, writing down a question in in the question section, but because we're now finished with all the whiskeys and we're gonna have a little rating in the end but mm -hmm. we want to have now a bit of an ama session so if you have any questions that you want to ask just write them in the um uh chat and we will have have them read out if we can find them but uh first of all i'll, I'll take my own question and answer it and the question is is whiskey vegan kosher and gluten-free first one vegan so the Ingredients are malted barley, water, and yeast. And yeast is a fungi, or yeah. So I don't count them as animals. They're not complex enough to be animals. So yes, they are. It's all plants. So it's that stuff inside is vegan. But 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 uh, if you have chill filtered whiskey, it's most likely that the filter is. A compound of uh, those small uh, filtering particles, and uh, they are glued together by a gelatine, and that gelatine is is uh, from uh, from cows, I think, isn't it? Yeah. So mm -hmm. gelatine uh, makes a whiskey non-vegan. So you should use uh, have unchill filtered whiskey. To mm -hmm. have a vegan whiskey. And you don't really know how the the label is glued on, but that's not should. inside. Uh, outside, this depends on your ethics. Yeah. If you're uh, depends on why you are vegan. Yeah. So. So uh, yeah, it's pretty vegan. So yeah. if you have something, it's not really in the whiskey. So the production material uh, might, might have some. some. Yeah. But the main production material is uh, wood. And that's also a plant. Um, so is it kosher? Well, there are a few whiskies that are kosher. One example here is the uh, Milk and Honey from Israel, which just came out. And there are other distilleries that do kosher whiskey. I think Koval does one, and there are a few other ones. And um, Glen Rothes. Glen Rothes mm -hmm. as well? Yeah. If you want to be kosher, you have to uh, sign up with your local rabbi. And he will check your distillery for a few things to be kosher. So you don't mix holy stuff with non-holy stuff. Holy stuff is like something like wine. So you're not allowed to distill wine on your still that you're using that's, to that's do... still wine. You don't uh, distill say cognac, wine? So. Cognac. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think sherry is also not allowed, but I'm not quite sure about that. So but talk to your local rabbi, rabbi to get uh, certified kosher. But and he has to come regularly for a certification and for tasting <laughs> 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 and so in the end uh, is it gluten free so gluten is the protein inside uh, some grains wheat. mainly wheat, mainly wheat. Um, so the barley has very 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 little gluten in it and but it has but it has mm -hmm. and when you mash it then you take out you want to take out the the starch and sugar and you want to leave the protein in because they give you a bit of taste so you mash for the sugars and the starches and you're left with the proteins and the the cows and, and the cattle and everything they are really fine with the leftovers because they're high in protein and that's what you want to feed to your cow so you take out mostly the starch and the sugars and there's very very little gluten left in there and then you come to the distilling and the distilling takes out 99.99 percent of the uh, gluten, mm -hmm. so you're left with something that is virtually gluten free. Yeah, so we not... can't <laughs> guarantee that it's gluten free, of course mm -hmm. not, because we do not have the uh, well, the education for deciding that we do not have 
uh, the analyzing equipment looking in, but mm -hmm. the logic says no. And I do have a, uh, a customer who told me he is very allergic on gluten and he had some, some medication close by and then he tried uh, with a whiskey, and tried and tried and well, uh, he didn't need his medicine. So it seems to him that it was enough yeah. gluten-free not to disturb him. Yeah, so that was the first question we asked ourselves, but now there are questions in here. Okay, I, and him one I would like to, to ask Kelsey. first. Oh, you go, go yeah. you go first. So there was a question uh, if uh, we're uh, wanting to start our own distilling. T question Have you gentlemen considered starting your own distillery? If so or not, what kind of whiskey would you make? Uh, well, we thought about that, but we decided not to do because it's really. Uh, expensive the investment is really high and uh, we're no we, we might have problems uh, because there are so many distilleries here in Germany so we had to go to Scotland that means relocation and then you have to compete with the real Scots and I think this chances to succeed in is not uh, that high uh, and what kind of whiskey I would have made, of course, single malt whiskey. And you probably a bourbon. Mm, mm. No, nah, I think I would have done a single malt as well. Uh, so uh, bourbon or scotch pen yeah. depends on the mood. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how I got this, this uh, rumor around that I really like bourbon. Yeah, I do like bourbon. But I think because my first real tour was to America and do the, did the bourbon tour, and then I had to do all the this, uh, bourbon tastings because uh, my host said, you know, oh, yeah, more. you've been to that distillery, yeah, yeah, do you do that. <laughs> so I really got the rumor that I'm really into bourbon. And yeah, I do like bourbon, but uh, it's not like I don't like other whiskey as well. So it really depends on your mood. If you're in, in for something really sweet and really interesting, then... Uh, yeah, bourbon might be a thing for you, but if you if you want to have something like really complex, then a scotch might be a better idea for you. So I can't really answer, give you a definite answer because it's just uh, I love so much variety, so can't mm -hmm. really go either way. Yeah, uh, about coloring. Sorry, same question again. Why should you coloring your whiskey anyway? It's a natural product in general, right? Why decide a silly to put caramel in a whiskey? Almost a shame. Yeah, that's because in former times, uh, if you put whiskey into the shelves and one was lighter than the other, then said, ooh, the lighter one must be the bad one. So it is a natural product with a variety in, in coloring. And so people would ask you why the light one. And the one in the supermarket, no idea why it's lighter. I will ask the manager. Mm -hmm. No idea. We, sh we send them back. And then you're getting all those bottles, light bottles back. And then people say, well, we're looking what is the darkest one we're getting out of production. And every other bottle we adjust to that darkest one. And there the coloring comes from. But there are some black sheep out there uh, who color whiskey for selling more. Putting a lot of color in it to make it darker than it is uh, naturally and that's a shame really mm -hmm. there was one question i think it's off off the screen now is uh do you have any other hin hin hobbies or interests fast i think there's one big interest i, I can't <laughs> stop telling so much <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's a he's a passionate electric car drive <laughs> but i i didn't get him to do the videos in english yet so <laughs> Yeah, too few time. Not enough time. So yeah. do you see a good good question? Uh, what is your take on whiskey malt from other places like India, Amrut, Paul John, Taiwan, Kavalan? Well, you have been to India. You have been to John Paul. Nice whiskeys. Um, in a general answer would be a lot of additive maturation. Not so much subtractive maturation because it's really, really hot. <laughs> so it's just evaporating like hell. It's evaporating like hell, so they don't become really that old. But the the wood, as it is warmer, is very very reactive. So there's a lot of intense flavors going into the whiskey. So it's really intense. But it's you do 
realize it's not that old. Yeah, and Taiwan, Kavalan is another thing. It's just right to the mountains. It's not that hot. And Kavalan is a, a really a good one. Really. Yeah, I really have to go to Kavalan. This is one of the distilleries that we haven't... An employee of us was there. Mm -hmm. And it's a wonderful, clean, tidy, exact mm -hmm. place. Wonderful. Speaking of... Is there a maximum amount of caramel? So to, to give you, João Pedro Marquez, uh, a hint how much caramel is in it. Uh, João if you Pedro have, Marquez. Uh, if you have... Is that guy famous? Uh, <laughs> the name probably, not the guy <laughs> writing that. Uh, if you have a full cask like this one, and you add caramel or spirit caramel, and it, you take a finger hut full of caramel and put it on the whole cask. So the amount of caramel you add is so few and uh, you can't taste it. So they took the, uh, the expert out there tasting uh, uh, caramelized or colored whiskey and uncolored whiskey from the same batch and they weren't able to taste the difference. So it's just, well, it's just a uncomfortness you have with that. No, Jao Pedro Marquez is there. <laughs> oh, he's really old, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> oh, wow. uh, okay. Ben is Googling, watch out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In which uh -huh. city do you live? Close to Munich, Germany. Does terrar matters with whiskey? Terrar, yet well, this is a, na uh, a word from from France where the wine uh, adds. Terrar is land, isn't it's it? It's land. It's soil. Soil uh, and takes uh, substances, uh, elements from the terrar and changes the taste of the wine, which is very important. Say from Bordeaux, they have different stones on the wine yards, and so they taste different from 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 mountain to mountain. From from hill to hill and uh, with whiskey you have on one side uh, the influence of the microclimate which is not that big as people say uh, it's really not that uh, grave because uh, air moves very fast and all the or lots of the distilleries are close to the water and the air passes around there and there are no difference from the air. The barley comes from everywhere. There are preferred uh, regions in the space side, in the highlands where barley is grown. Um, but the kind or the species of the barley has a bigger influence than the soil the barley is, is growing on. Um, so to say no, but the wood makes a difference. They made uh, tests with uh, oak trees in Spain from different uh, 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 hillsides and they made a difference in taste. So terrar makes a difference, but with the casks. Yeah. <laughs> and what also is really influential is uh, climate, especially the temperature. So that means not only being at the sea level, but being up in the highlands where the snow is there, above the snow line, below the snow yeah. line. Uh, or in really the tropical yeah. country or in a hot and cold country, country like Kentucky or in a very humid and mild country like Scotland. So that there's a lot of difference. So yeah, climate and terrain for the uh, wood. Yeah. So Horst, which is your favorite electric vehicle? Tesla. Driving it since 2013. What is your strongest piece of whiskey you have ever reviewed? This is the right above my head here, dude. This is second strongest, I think. Uh, it's an Octomore, and the strongest is also an Octomore. <laughs> 248. Something. I think I had the white one, that, which was 260 or something like uh -huh, that. Uh, okay. There was, I think, there was one 300. I didn't have that one yet. Um, yeah. So the the Octomore are the strongest ones. Which one was the strongest one you tried? Did you try an Octomo? Yes, I tried one, one of the first. Oh, they were strong as well. But yeah, 160 or something. And uh, this uh, one is an old bottle, maybe that's your bottle. Uh, probably. Mm -hmm. And I had these Supernova from Artbeck with 100. Mm -hmm. This was the first high P. 
ppm whiskey. Uh, why uh, you stopped reviewing the Diageo special releases? They are on my table. I'm going to taste them, but I had <laughs> been on vacations and didn't have the time. Yeah. Okay. So what's the what's the time? Speaking of time. Horse, would you consider making uh -huh. videos in your non-whiskey-related YouTube channel with English subtitles? Wow. Oh, I, I've tried. <laughs> now you've tried. <laughs> but there are new software, new software coming up. Is there uh, new software coming up? That's this translated. is not that bad. What YouTube provides is, well, it's <laughs> nothing. Yeah. I don't know. There, there's in OBS. It would be it would be great if, if OBS would function. But I think as we can speak English, uh, yeah, it just takes double the time. <laughs> Okay, so, so I think, I think ten, we're through. Ten to ten. Ten to ten. So yeah, thank you very much for watching. Um, the next uh, tasting is not going to be a whiskey tasting. Maybe we'll have one whiskey, um, but uh, it's going to be an ask me anything. Yeah, we don't call it an F FAQ anymore because it's like not frequently asked questions, but it's like you can ask us anything about whiskey. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, Ask Me Anything will be on the 27th of March 2020 and it will be in English at 8 o'clock and if you speak German you can go at 7 o'clock Central European time uh, because that will be on whiskey.de. So yeah, tune in. So the 28pm uh, is Central European time. Oh yeah, well. Central European. And we have to watch out for that one because uh, I think no, the it's day best. after... The day after, no, no, three is days. Is it still winter time or is it summer time? Oh. I think that the at the end of March is the end of winter time. So, yeah, watch out for that one. Just go on whiskey.com slash live and you'll find out when it is. And, yeah, maybe it changes for an hour <laughs> because of the summer winter time. So, thank you very much for watching. Uh, if you like this video, then please feel free to give us a thumbs up and see you next time.